Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. We're going back to Smyrna Christian Church, back in Ezekiel, picking up in chapter 34 tonight. In chapter 33, we had the chapter about the watchmen, and we had quite a bit about that in chapter 3 as well. But always remember, we are to warn the people, and we warn the people what the Bible says. Not going way off track, you know, trying to make up our own interpretations, but you stick to God's Word. And we warn the people what the Word of God says is coming. And yes, of course, we watch what's going on in the world. We pay attention. But don't ever forget Mark chapter 13, verse 23, Christ said, Behold, I have foretold you all things. And if you don't know what the Scripture says, you're going to be deceived. So stick to the Word of God exactly as it's written. In this chapter 34, we're going to be learning about shepherds. Of course, there is only one true shepherd. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, where he would even say, I am the good shepherd. Psalm chapter 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And of course, Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Now this word shepherd that we're going to have in this chapter quite a few times, the word in the Hebrew is ra'ah. And it can mean like a pastor, and it's even translated as a pastor in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. And it can also be like a ruler, like a king. So you remember that? Let's get into chapter 34. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name. Amen. So, all right, we pick it up. Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 1, and it reads, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? And what's a pastor or a preacher supposed to do? Supposed to feed the flock with the word of God. But many, they just want to feed themselves. They do it even for their own gain. You remember when they were buying and selling in the temple in John chapter 2? In about verse 16, he told them those that were selling doves, said, Get them out of here. He said, Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. But unfortunately, many, many churches do today. And it's like, how do people not see what's going on when God said that's exactly what you're not supposed to do? Verse 3, ye eat the fat and ye clothe you with the wool. I mean, you make it real good for yourself, even living luxurious, luxuriously. Ye kill them that are fed. Many, they do not like when someone actually starts to teach the true word of God. Because sometimes that will even bring people out of their church. Because they realize, oh, well, the word's not being taught there. But ye feed not the flock. You don't teach the truth. You might think about Hophni and Phinehas in 1 Samuel chapter 2, and where it mentions about the, the word kick is used there, and uh, how that they kick against, and that Hebrew word is only used there, and in Deuteronomy chapter 32, that song of Moses, even when it's talking about Jeshurun, I believe it's chapter 32, verse 15 to be exact. But Hophni and Phinehas, they were priests, but they ripped the people off every chance that they could. Not only that, they began to, to lay with the women and they made people abhor the sacrifice. So judgment begins at the house of God, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. And woe to those that do not feed the flock. Woe to those that do not teach the word of God exactly as it's written. Verse 4, The diseased have ye not strengthened, Neither have ye healed that which was sick. It, apparently they don't teach James chapter 5, verse 14 through 16, where you find out that if, if any be sick, let them, call for the, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, let them call for the elders of the church and pray over them, anointing them with oil, that's olive oil, in the name of the Lord. 
And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And if they've committed sins, they'll be forgiven. It says, pray for one another that you may be healed. Many people, they don't teach that. They don't know that you're supposed to use that olive oil and anointing and obedience to God, even though it's written so clear right in the Bible. Neither have you bound up that which was broken. Psalm chapter 147, verse 3, God says that he does heal the brokenhearted. And how much comfort and peace does God's word give you? I mean, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 is the chapter that comes to mind immediately about how to get through some really hard times, how to get through sad times. Neither have you brought again that which was driven away. Neither have you sought that which was lost. And that, that's what we're supposed to do, seek the lost. But with force and with cruelty... Have you ruled them? That um, The word cruelty there, that Hebrew word is also used in Exodus chapter 1 where it talks about how the Egyptians ruled over Egypt with cruelty. But you see, it's so important. It says they, they don't seek the lost. And some people, they get a little bit of knowledge. And then they just want to bulldoze over people with it. They want to act like other, everyone else is stupid. They, they don't seek the lost. And that, and you see, if you're always acting so arrogant, acting like other people are stupid, no one's ever going to listen to what you say. You're not going to reach new people. And then there's some people that they just want to be like, oh, well, I know a whole lot about God's word. I only want to have super deep conversations with people that whole, know a whole lot about the word. Well, then you, you've already completely gone off the path of God's way because we are to seek the lost and as soon as you think that, as soon as you decide you don't have time for the, the, the lower or people that don't know as much anymore, then you've made one of the biggest mistakes anyone could ever, ever make. And you've forsaken the way of God. Anytime you always teach in a way that anyone, even if they've never heard one word of the Bible, you teach it in a way that they can understand it. That they don't, they don't feel like they're stupid or something like that. You teach it with grace with love. And like I said, you get a little knowledge. You don't just bulldoze over people with it. Oh, you're stupid for celebrating Easter. And yeah, of course, e Easter's pagan completely. But you don't just bulldoze over people with it. You're supposed to be gentle. And yes, it's a tragedy that that is celebrated in many places. But if you just instantly, you just want to run over people with that, they're not going to listen to you. You have to be gentle. Oh, you're an idiot for eating pork. Well, yeah, we're not supposed to eat pork, but make note of Romans chapter 14. You have to plant seeds. You have to be gentle. Of course, you always have to teach God's word exactly as it's written, and you don't compromise the truth ever. You teach the word of God boldly, exactly as it's written. But my point is you don't lead with those things. You don't just run over people with those things. You have to be gentle planting the seeds in a way that anyone can understand it. Seek the lost. That's what Jesus Christ did. He seeks the lost. And make note of Luke chapter 15, a very, very beautiful chapter, how it says that even if just one sheep is lost, the shepherd will leave the 99 and go seek the one that was lost. And then when that one is found, when he comes to Jesus Christ, there's even rejoicing in heaven amongst the angels. That's how incredible it is. But if you just want to, if you don't try to heal up the sick, if you don't try to seek the lost, then you've gone astray from God's way. This verse is also very interesting because it's, it's very, very similar to what it says in Zechariah chapter 11, verse 16 and 17, where it's talking about the idle shepherd. And of course, that's Satan, even prophecy of when he arrives, the false Christ. It says there, he doesn't heal the wounded. He doesn't bind them up. So you understand when you go this way, you don't strengthen or, or try to heal or try to seek the lost. You're going the way of Satan. You're going the way of the false shepherd. Verse 5. And they were scattered because there was there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field. What about those four beasts of Daniel chapter 7? When they were scattered. It says in Romans chapter uh, 10, I believe it is, it says, How can one hear without a preacher? And it says, And how can one preach except they be sent? 
Then it goes on to say, faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. Verse 6, My sheep wandered through all the mountains and up on every high hill. And you know from James chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, that the twelve tribes are scattered. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Verse 7, Therefore, ye shepherds, Hear the word of the Lord. That's what, what do you, when you go to church, what are you doing there? Well, when you get done with the church service, ask yourself, what did I learn about God's word there? And you, many might say, oh, I don't know, but it sure did feel good. Well, then it's of the flesh. Traditions of men, I mean, uh, the word of God feels very good. Make no mistake. But the point is, if you just say it felt good, but you didn't learn anything, then, then you didn't do God's work there. But like I said, there is no greater feeling than truly studying God's Word. I mean, when you go to a church that teaches the Word, you'll feel fantastic afterwards because you did learn the truth. You learned, you learned the words of Almighty God. And I wanted to make one more note about concerning seeking the lost and maybe those who are having a rough time. Make note of Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. It says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. You be humble. You be gentle. You don't go judging people because maybe they're doing things a little different than you're doing. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Get the giant board out of your own eye when you just keep trying to get little specks out of other people's eye. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Verse 8, As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Make note of John chapter 10, where Christ, where he says there, I am the good shepherd. I think that's the chapter says, I'm the good shepherd. And he says, I am the door. Anyone that tries to go in any other way is a thief and a robber. And it says there that, you see, when the wolf comes, the hireling, I meaning he's just, he's just hired, he's just doing it for the money, basically. When the wolf run, comes, the hireling is going to run because he doesn't care about the flock. But a true shepherd that was sent from Almighty God, he, he loves to stand against the wolf. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20, you have power over Satan and over evil spirits through the name of Jesus Christ. So you don't run away. You run toward the wicked one to stand against him. We don't fear Satan. He fears you if you use the power of the name of Jesus Christ. But what is so sad is many, many preachers, they, I mean... I mean, there are some preachers that they do, they just completely do it for the money. They're ripping people off. They're, they're going in the way of evil. That's how it is for some. But there are very many that they have good intentions, but they were just never taught the Word of God. And uh, judgment begins at the house of God. So, I mean, they're going to have to answer for that. But what a tragedy. I mean, they go to seminary or whatever. They learn a whole lot of stuff about probably how to pass plates and, and how to raise money. And that's what, that's what they think being a preacher is about when it's not at all. But I just say that because, I mean, it's so tragic that many, they have good intentions, but they were just misled so terribly. Why? Because there was no shepherd at least they didn't find one, but praise God that he has always sent people who will teach the truth. And the word of God does say, if you seek, you will find. So seek the word of God and don't ever forget that Christ is the true shepherd. There's many people that they just, they go to the same church. Oh, well, my whole family, generation after generation has gone to this church. So that's what I'm going to do. Well, but what if the word of God's not taught there? Ask yourself, is that church your shepherd? Or is Jesus Christ the shepherd? You have to follow God's word. It might not be easy. Some, you might have to cause some waves a little bit between your family or whatever. But a whole lot better to do that than to go to hell, right? I mean, it's a whole lot better at least to do that than to worship the false Christ. 
I mean, come on. Verse, where did we get to? Verse 9. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. There it is again. Not man's words, but God's words. Verse 10. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and will require my flock at their hand. That should remind you of the Watchman chapter, verse 33. If you don't warn the people what's coming, their blood's on your hands. And it's going to be a spiritual death for many. Spiritual blood by being deceived. And cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. Make note of Zechariah chapter 13, where there's be one who claimed to be a prophet, but then he was teaching lies, so even his own parents let him know, hey, you're a liar. And, but then when the time came, when he realized how bad it was going to be for him, he said, oh, I'm not a prophet, I'm just a, I'm just a farmer. He said something like that, I'm not really a prophet. Well, you claim to be. You claimed to be a teacher. You claimed that you were really something, that you were spreading the word of God. But if you taught lies, then you weren't, and you are going to pay for it. it says there's, they're not going to wear a rough garment to deceive anymore. Verse 11. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. Once again, even if he just loses one, he leaves the 99 to seek the lost. Praise God. You always teach in a way that you're seeking the lost. And I want to make something real clear that there, there's sometimes people, I mean, yes, we, we love to study prophecy. Pretty much any time we're teaching, we're going to bring some prophecy out. But you can't only teach the prophecy. You have to teach the entire word of God. And make no mistake, if you just get so focused on the prophecy that that's all, you, that's all you try to do, and you leave out teaching Jesus Christ crucified, you leave out teaching about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you can be sure God's not going to give you the understanding of the prophecy because you left out the most important thing. You have to teach the entire Word of God. And when you do teach the entire Word of God, you're going to find little snippets that many people would just completely read over but it's going to click and it's going to help you understand the prophecy even better. That's how the Word of God is. That's how complete it is. You have to teach all of it. Verse 12. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. Of course, we're going all the way to the Lord's day. This is prophecy, even when through the return of Jesus Christ. That's going to be such a cloudy and dark day for many. You know why? Because they're going to realize that they were deceiving the false Christ. They were, they're going to realize they were deceived and were worshiping the false Christ because they had no shepherd to teach them that the false Christ arrives first. As you see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Mark 13, and just over and over and over in the Word of God. Revelation chapter 12, Revelation 13. I mean, just over and over and over. Verse 13. And I wanted to mention, I meant to mention this at the beginning of the study. I'll go ahead and say it now that remember the last nine chapters of Ezekiel, chapter 40 through 48. They're all about the millennium, that thousand-year teaching period of Revelation 20. Now, this chapter, we're really starting to lead into that. Because this is even prophecy of when Christ returns and the millennium begins. And you're really going to see it when we get further down in this chapter. So this is kind of, the, remember, we had the Babylonian War from chapter 24 to 32. Teach new, the king of Babylon is coming. The false Christ is coming. Then we had that watchman chapter in chapter 33. Now we begin to usher, to prepare us into the way to learn about the millennium of Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48. Verse 13. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and will feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. You understand that Christ is coming here? A lot of people, they want to go somewhere else. Well, Christ is coming here. 
to set the kingdom up here. And we're going to read even about the allotments of the land of the 12 tribes of Israel during the millennium when we get to Ezekiel chapter 48, the last chapter. Why would you want to go somewhere else when Christ is coming here? And so people say, oh, we're going and coming back, going and going back. No, you're not. Unless you die in the flesh first. Verse 14. I will feed them in good pasture, the, the good shepherd, the true shepherd. Imagine how amazed it's going to be when Jesus Christ returns and he'll be teaching. You don't have to question if what he says is true because every single word out of his mouth will be an absolute fact. See, with me or with any other man, you better not take my word for it. You better check it out on your own. But when Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, returns, you don't have to know. You don't, you don't have to question if it's true or not. You will know that every single word is true. I will feed them in a good pasture. And upon the high mountains of Israel shall their, shall their fold be. Their fold, that's a, a habitation, a dwelling place, a home. There shall they lie in a good fold, and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. That word of fold, like I said, it means a home or a residence. The word is nave in the Hebrew. When you take it back to the original word, it even means rest, beauty, and to celebrate with praises. It's going to be an incredible time when Jesus Christ returns for those who remain loyal to Him. But you see, those who are still worshiping Satan, the false Christ, when Jesus Christ returns, they're going to be spiritually dead for the thousand years. They're still going to have a mortal soul, but they will be taught and they will have the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ in the millennium and live forever. Verse 16, actually verse 15, I will feed my flock and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. You'll have peace. You'll have complete rest. That's how it is when, when an animal of the flock, when he rise down, when he lies down, he, 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 he is at peace. He's at safety. That's exactly how we will feel in the millennium. But you understand, really, we feel super, super safe even today. Because you know that God is with you. And he even will make, if your ways are pleasing to God, He will even make your enemies be at peace with you. Remember Proverbs chapter 16, 7. So you don't have to fear even today. But it's going to be even on a whole new level when Christ returns. Verse 16. I will seek that which was lost. There it is again. Don't be a holier than thou hypocrite. Isaiah 65. They said, oh, don't come near me. I'm holier than thou. Then what good are you if you won't seek the lost? Christ went among the sinners. And bring again that which was driven away. And will bind up that which was broken. And will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. Meaning those that they ripped people off and lived luxuriously. Those who really thought they were getting ahead in the ways of the world and doing evil. God said, I'm going to destroy it. And I will feed them with judgment. There's so much in this verse. First of all, driven away. That Hebrew word in other places is even translated as an outcast. Some people, they, uh, I just thought of, remember in the Gospel of Luke when you have the holier-than-thou hypocrite, when he was saying, oh, God, I'm so thankful I'm not like this sinner over there. I'm not like these others. When, I mean, he was one of the biggest sinners of them all. But then you had the guy in the back who was a public, and he was so, being so humble, he wouldn't even lift his head up, and he was just saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And it says that, that the, the one who was a sinner, he, he went home a whole lot more justified than the holier than thou hypocrite. And how many people, they, they go to church and they feel like an outcast because people, that it's just so judgmental when you go into many churches. Oh, you're not one of us. I mean, can you, could you imagine being in the shoes of a person that would act like that? When we're supposed to welcome anyone into the church as long as they have a sincere heart. If they come in the church trying to stir up all type of problems, yeah, you cast them out. You get them out. You don't put up with that in the church. But if someone, maybe they just had a rough go of things. Maybe they've committed a bunch of sins. Might not have on some nice clothes or whatever. What do you do? You bring them in. Hey, we're happy to have you. Come on. Let's learn about the Word of God together. Let's learn about Jesus Christ. 
And if you were to do anything other than that, if you were to treat them any different than you would anyone else, you are going to pay so dearly. Christ set the example. We are to follow that. God is not a respect of, of persons. He does not show partiality. He does not show favoritism. But even those that they might have felt like an outcast, they might have been even driven away from the church because church, some churches act like Jesus Christ doesn't forgive sins. It doesn't matter what you've done. If you've repented, it's erased. And don't ever let some church try to bring it back up to you or charge it against you. It's erased because of the blood of Christ. If you sincerely repented, but even those that might have been driven out of churches and outcasts, Christ says, going to say, bring them in. Come on in. I love you. Also, uh, make note of Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 through 3, where um, it says, uh, how I, it says I, I am sent to, to proclaim um, and to, to heal up the brokenhearted, to set free the prisoners, to proclaim the day. And then it goes on to also mention the, the day of vengeance. But that's what Christ does. You understand that? He can loose you of any shackle. He can loose you of addiction. Whether it be drugs or, or whatever. Any type of wicked type of mindset. Any unrighteous ways. Jesus Christ will set you free. He looses the shackles. He lets the prisoners out of the prison. If you ask Him. And if you put forth the effort. That Isaiah 61, that's even in Luke chapter 4, Jesus Christ, he started reading Isaiah chapter 61. But he only, re he only read a little bit of it, then he closed the book. Because he said, the acceptable day of the Lord, this day this is fulfilled. That was the first advent. But that day of vengeance, that's at the second advent. But vengeance, vengeance on the wicked, but for, it is going to be re incredible rewards for those who serve Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, Eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor hath entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. And that's even quoted from the Old Testament where it even says, Those who wait for Him. You wait on the true Christ. Verse 17, now, verses one, this is one chapter that I, I'm going to take the opportunity to point out how awesome the structures are in the Companion Bible. How it, like, it'll give you the subject. Like verse 1 through 16, your little note in the side column will say 1 through 16 is false shepherds. Then it'll tell you chapter, verses 17 through 22 is the flock. And, and so on and so forth. So those uh, structures in the Companion Bible are awesome. You can utilize those. So verse, for the first 16 verses we had the shepherds. Now in these next few verses we're going to be learning about the flock. Those who were supposed to learn from the shepherds. But unfortunately there's many false shepherds. Many false prophets are gone out into the world. Matthew 7, 1 John chapter 4. So let's go verse 17. And as for you, O my flock, and who, who is God's flock? Christians. They believe in Jesus Christ. They're of the flock. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between the rams and the he goats, whether they be rich or poor, but whatever. God's not a respecter of persons. If they follow God, they're going to be blessed. If they don't, then God's wrath's coming down. And once again, whether this be like leaders or, or people lower on the totem pole or whatever, anyone. Verse 18. Seemeth it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture? Now to eat up the good pasture, that, that's to hear the truth. This is a very important verse. So he's saying, don't you realize how awesome it is that you heard the truth? But ye must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures, or of your pastures, and to have drunk of the deep waters. But ye must foul the residue with your feet. You just muddy it all up. This verse is so important. Even there, you see, there are many, many people. They have been taught the truth. They found a shepherd that taught the word of God exactly as it was written. But then they will not stick to the truth. They just want to listen to all types of garbage, go off on all types of other stuff that mean nothing. 
That they forsake the Word of God. And you know what you do? You muddy the waters completely to where when someone might listen to you, they can't get to the truth no matter how hard they try. Because you forsook the Word of God and you went in the way of distraction. You went in the way of the world when you could have just stuck to the Word. But since you didn't, you are even muddying it for everyone else. For anyone that comes in contact with you, instead of you bringing them to the truth, you're bringing them to confusion. How much is someone going to pay when they heard the truth, but they wouldn't stick to it? 19. And as for my flock, they eat that which you have trodden with your feet. They listen to the garbage that you peddled. And they drink that which you have fouled with your feet. Verse 20. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and between the lean cattle. Whatever situation someone might be in. You see, there's no... I'm just going to keep going. 21. Because ye have thrust with side and with shoulder and pushed all the disease with your horns. You, you took advantage of people that might have been weaker or people that might have not known much about the Word or whatever. You took advantage of them till you have scattered them abroad. That word pushed, it could even, the Hebrew word can even mean to make war against. 22. Therefore will I save my flock, and they shall no more be a prey, and I will judge between cattle and cattle. And understand, many times, two different groups of people, or, well, would it say that it doesn't matter, the point I'm trying to get at, it doesn't matter how someone um, might appear. I mean, they might appear super religious, you know. But if they don't teach the Word of God, if, if, if I'm saying if they claim to be a preacher or a teacher of God's Word or whatever, but if they don't teach the Word of God, then you better not listen to it. It might look the same as someone that is teaching the truth. Might wear, be wearing the same clothes or whatever. That's just an example. But the point is, God says, I'm going to judge between cattle and cattle. The point is, what matters is what you do. Not how you look. Not what people you are. Not how much money you have. What matters is what you do. Do you stick to God's Word or not? Verse 23. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. Now, this is not, of course, talking about David, of David who was the father of Solomon and the son of Jesse. This is talking about the one who came through the offspring of David. This is talking about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, like it says, one shepherd... So that there is only one true shepherd. That's our Savior, Jesus Christ. And once again, this is prophecy of the millennium. This is prophecy of when Jesus Christ returns. 24, And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Once again, when it's talking about David here, it's talking about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I just want to read a few verses in 1 Peter chapter 5. Turn there with me. Now, what is so amazing about this, how we have Christ called David here, and He's called the Prince. Once again, this is preparing us for the millennium chapters of Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48. Because there it's going to mention the Prince. And there's a certain place that talks about a certain door that no man can go through. But it says the prince can go through it. Well, it's talking about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's certainly not talking about David, of the David who was the king of Judah, the father of Solomon. Because see, David, that David, he's just like us. Like passion, just like us. But Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And he will be that prince. And he will be that shepherd during the millennium. And like I said, this chapter 34 and on, it's really starting to prepare us for those millennium chapters. Let's go 1 Peter chapter 5, picking it up, verse 1. And it reads, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, 
and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Verse 2, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. That means you be very diligent. You do your homework. If you're about to have a Bible study with someone else, if you're about to get together to talk about God's Word, you better study what you're going to talk about before. We're not playing church here. You better study diligently so you know what you're teaching is true. And so when people ask you questions, so you can answer them. And of course, no one knows everything. There's been plenty of times people have asked me a question and I said, I just didn't know. Let's try to find out though. Let's dig into the Word. But the point is, if you don't know, just say you don't know. You certainly don't make up an answer but you want to be studied well enough in God's Word where you can answer the, at least a good number of questions that people ask you, and you want to be able to go straight and prove it straight from the Word. And some might say, well, I don't have that good a memory. Well, well, that's okay. The main thing is you remember what the Word says. You might not be able to remember, oh, well, this says this is exact this verse and so forth, but take good notes and God will give you the recall for what He wants you to remember. God's in control. I don't want anyone to get on a guilt trip because they think they might not have that good a memory or something like that. That's, that's fine. Just you, God will help you remember what you need to remember if you take the oversight. If you be diligent. Not by constraint. That means if you were just, oh, I got to go do this Bible study today. I don't really want to. Well, then you bet you can be sure that you're going to lose a lot of blessings if that's the type of mindset that you have. God will probably take that Bible study completely away from you. To constrain would be, like, oh, I, that you, I, I, I don't want to do this, but I have to. What, what a, if, if that's someone's mindset, you can be pretty sure God didn't send them. So that's what it means. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, not just for your own gain, your greed, but of a ready mind. You be cheerful, you be focused. How could you not be cheerful when, when you have the truth of God's Word? Verse 3, Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock, you set the example you don't act like, oh, I am so wise. I know so much about the Scriptures. You guys are all under me. You listen to me. No, that's what the heathen do. You remember Matthew chapter 20, verse 25 through 26? The heathen uh, exalt themselves over others. That's not what a Christian does. No, you teach in a way that anyone can understand it. If someone, they never studied the Bible and they want to be a part of your group, praise God, the angels are rejoicing over that. You don't just want to, oh, I just want to be with a whole bunch of super intelligent, super deep people. No, then you don't understand how to be a shepherd. Then you don't understand what our true job is, is to bring people to Jesus Christ. You teach on those multiple levels. Verse 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, that's of course our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that one who was called David in Ezekiel 34. He will also be called so in Ezekiel 37. When the chief shepherd appears, that's at the seventh trumpet, the return of Jesus Christ. Of course, the deception of the false Christ is before that at the sixth trumpet. When the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. I was going to stop there, but I actually I want to skip down. I want to read verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil has a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in, the, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Anything you're going through, it's common to many other people. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And not only that, people are going through what you're going through and they're getting through it. So you can too. Be sober. Be vigilant. If you were anything but that during the tribulation of the false Christ, there's no doubt you would be deceived. This is not the time to be playing games. Remember what, like it says in the Gospels, if a person says, oh, the Lord delayeth this coming, he, he's not coming anytime soon, then they begin to, to eat and drink and be drunken, beat the maid servants and the men servants. It says then the Lord's going to come in a day when he's not expecting it. 
So never say, oh, the Lord's coming. Not, he's, not, he's never coming anytime soon. I'm going to do whatever I want for a while and then start serving God. No, you're going to be deceived. That's the type of mindset you have. Be sober. Be vigilant. Don't even give Satan one inch. You have power over him through the name of Jesus Christ. Come out of all of your sins. Repent. Yes, we all make mistakes. We all fall short. We're all going to sin at times. But when you do, repent and don't go back to it. But if you're just staying in a certain sin, you're giving the devil, letting him walk right through your door. Do not let that happen. Back to Ezekiel 34, verse 25. And I will make with them a covenant of peace. And will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land. You find out what happens to him in Isaiah chapter 34. Those evil beasts. It's interesting. That little... You have um, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. And Jeremiah chapter 4 about verse 23 or so. You have the little phrase. Tuhu vabuhu in the Hebrew. It means completely indistinguishable wreck. And those verses even talking about the destruction of the first earth age. But there is only one other word, there's only one other verse in the entire Word of God where those, those words tuhu and boohoo are used in the same uh, sentence, in the same verse. And it's in Isaiah chapter 34. I didn't write down the verse. I don't remember the exact verse. But it's where it talks about um, the stones of emptiness and, and confusion. You can seek that out in Isaiah 34. That's tuhu and boohoo. So you can know that's serious destruction for those evil beasts. And they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. That's how it's going to be for those who serve Jesus Christ. You can read about that, about the millennium also in Isaiah chapter 11. When it says, The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, and the truth will be taught. Praise God. 26. And I will make them in the places round about my hill a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessings. We're going to get a lot more detail into that when we get to Ezekiel chapter 47. 27. And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit. And the earth shall yield her increase. And they shall be safe in their land. Once again, just wait till we get to chapter 47 for that. That word safe, it's awesome when you check it out in your strong concordance. It will let you know that it means to, to literally be safe. It's a fact that you are safe, but also that you feel safe in your mind. That's how exactly how it's going to be. Continuing 27. And shall know that I am the Lord, when I have broken the bands of their yoke, and delivered them out of the hands of those that serve themselves of them, and praise God for it. Speaks about in that Ezekiel 47 how the, those trees will be fruit for meat and the leaves for medicine. It's fantastic. 28. It might even remind you of Revelation chapter 21 or 22. It speaks about basically the same thing. But you see, Ezekiel 47 is the millennium. Revelation 21 and 22 is the eternity, the third earth age, which is after the millennium. 28. And they shall no more be a prey to the heathen. Neither shall the beast of the land devour them. Well, do you, who is the beast of Revelation 13? It's Satan. What happens when Jesus in Revelation chapter 17? We'll make that very clear for you if you have any doubt. But you see, when Jesus Christ returns at the second advent, Satan, he's going to be thrown in the pit for that thousand years where he will have no influence whatsoever on anybody. And once again, those people, there will be many people who will be taught. But those of you who stand against the false Christ, you're going to be a priest and reign with Jesus Christ through that thousand years. you learn about that in Revelation 20. We'll also learn about that when we get to Ezekiel 44. But so Satan is going to have no influence through that thousand years. But then at the end of the thousand years, he's going to be let out to test the people who are being taught. And if they follow Satan at the end of the thousand years, after they saw Jesus Christ face to face, and after they were taught in a spiritual body, because you see, when Jesus Christ returns, everyone's changed into a spiritual body. 
1 Corinthians 15, 52. So you know if you're still in the flesh, Christ has not returned. But those that are being taught in the millennium, there will be no more hang-ups of the flesh. They'll be in a spiritual body. They will literally see Christ, and there'll be no influence from Satan at all. So then if they would still choose to follow Satan at the end of the millennium, good riddance to them. They'll die the second death. They'll be blotted out, never to be heard of again. Continuing 28. But they shall dwell safely, once again, those who serve Jesus Christ. And none shall make them afraid. 29. And I will raise up for them a plant of renown. Once again, this is speaking of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's called the branch of Zamak in the Hebrew in uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. He's also called the branch in Zechariah chapter 14, or chap Zechariah chapter 6, where it says he will be a, a priest upon his throne. Jesus Christ is the priest king. But remember, Satan, when he arrives, the false Christ, he is going to be the false priest king because he's not only taken over. Um, What's the word I'm thinking of? Political, I guess you could say. He's not only taken over political, which he will do that as well, but he's taken over religion, claiming to be king of kings, priest of priests, and lord of lords. But he's the false king. He's the false priest. The false lord. The idle shepherd is what he's called in Zechariah 11, as we mentioned before. The false one comes first. So uh, he's also, Christ is called the rod, and that one that would come out of the stem of Jesse through the offspring of Jesse and David in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. So Christ is that plant of renown. And they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen anymore. Jesus Christ would say in John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Make note of Amos in the Minor Prophets, chapter 8, verse 11, where it says there's a time coming that there'll be a famine, but it's not for bread nor for thirst for water, but for hearing the words of the Lord. When you go to a church service, when it's over, ask yourself, what did I learn from God's Word there? If it, the answer is nothing, if the answer is you just heard the same thing, the same salvation message you've been hearing over and over and over, week after week after week, and you just did a whole bunch of stuff that seemed religious, but God's Word wasn't taught there, you might want to really take a step back and ask, am I truly serving God or not? Consider your ways. Verse 30. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord their God, am with them. And that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. Verse 31 to complete. And ye, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. God making it very clear that we're not really talking about actual shepherds and actual sheep here. No, we're talking about men. Talking about the flock, which is, which is all men and women. And we're talking about false shepherds and true shepherds. And then we're talking about the one true shepherd, the chief shepherd, like we read of in Peter, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Christ is our example. And don't ever forget, He is the one. He is the true shepherd. You don't ever follow or put your trust in some man. You don't put your trust in me or anyone else. Don't ever take my word for something I say. You can't do that. You have to study it for yourself. And once again, when any church someone might, that you might go to, any, of course, we are not any denomination, but any church, no matter what denomination they might claim to be, if they're teaching the word of God straight out of the Bible, teaching the truth, it's good. And so we don't judge churches, of course, but... The point is, all that matters is what God's Word says. There are many false shepherds. There are many false prophets. And they, many people, they're going to be deceived by the false Christ. Do not be deceived. Stick to God's Word. Set the example. Plant those seeds. Share the truth. Make sure what you're saying you can prove straight from the Word of God. And just stick to the Word. Don't go off the rails on a whole bunch of nonsense. That means nothing. Don't muddy up the waters. 
Stick to the Word of God. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your Word. We ask you to continue to give us understanding and understanding of your prophecy, not just for ourselves, but so we can share it with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name. Amen. This was recorded in the year 2023 at Smyrna Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.